joining us on another episode of The Vegan Pulse. I am your host, Nancy Arenas. Today, my guest is Gabriel Garden. His passion is for nutrition and the reason why he is a registered dietitian. In this segment of The Vegan Pulse, we are introducing Making Sense with Gabriel. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, Gabriel. Welcome back to Making Sense with Gabriel. Hi, Nancy. Great to be here. Thank you for having me. So, like, I just like to get right on to it because you have a lot of information and I want to get as much information out as I can for our viewers when it comes to these health concerns and things we are asked or hear about. So I'm going to start with, it must be really hard to be vegan. Yeah, it sure is. You know, I've been doing it for about seven years now. And uh, every day I wake up and I just say, oh, man, I got to get through another day of being vegan. You know, it's just <laughs> it's a real heavy weight on my shoulders. No, it. Um, you know, it's really not. Uh, it's only um, it's only hard because of the barriers that we personally put up because we get, you know, fear in our head. And we start to make all these, oh, I'm going to miss this food or oh, my family, you know, reunion is going to be doing this and it's going to be awkward if I, you know, tell them that I don't eat meat and cheese and eggs anymore. And how am I going to deal with that? Or, oh, how am I going to go out to eat with my friends and socialize if I'm not a vegan anymore? So we just start to create all these fictitious stories in our head. And not to say that dealing with the family reunion or dealing with eating out don't present challenges. They certainly do. I don't want to belittle anybody's fears or belittle the real life circumstances uh, within which people find themselves that present difficulties to maintaining a plant-based or vegan diet. Um, those things are all real. Um, but the bottom line is, is if this is a lifestyle that you're committed to, um, we find ways to plan ahead so that we can continue to be successful long-term. And the other thing is a healthy lifestyle helps to reinforce the maintenance of a healthy lifestyle, right? So as I went plant-based and adopted a vegan lifestyle, uh, number one, I fell in love with, not only was I feeling better, I say I used to be addicted to food, but now I'm addicted to feeling good. And so that reinforces itself. So the better I ate, which include, included adopting a more and more plant-based diet, a vegan whole food plant-based diet, I found out that when I ate other foods, now of course I went kind of vegan overnight, right? I watched this documentary, Forks Over Knives, the extended interviews, and the extended interviews is kind of a, a, an, a, an addendum or an, an, a, an accompaniment documentary that the producers at Forks Over Knives, many people have heard of that wonderful documentary. It's an additional documentary that uh, the producers made that uh, just sits down with all of the doctors that are really pioneers in the whole food plant-based, you know, vegan space within medicine and within it specifically health. And they ask them all these questions about nutrition, kind of like you and I are doing now. And they just give all these great evidence-based answers to, you know, well, what about dairy? Don't we need the calcium from, from uh, cow's milk in order to build strong bones? And then the doctors say, well, no, you really don't. And here's why. And so when I saw that documentary, a light flashed inside my head. I really saw the light for the first time when it came to nutrition. And I said, wow, it really makes sense to live a whole food plant-based diet, vegan diet, and so I'm, I'm not going to create excuses for why I shouldn't do it. I'm going to, you know, start to uh, create a plan and reasons why I should do it. And I'm going to follow that lifestyle. And then, like I say, as I did it, it reinforced doing it more because I felt better and better. I got rid of all these chronic digestive issues that I had. And I started to uh, get more control over my eating, right? Like I say, before I felt like I was a food addict. I would reach for food when I felt emotional. I would reach for food when I felt tired. Uh, reach for food to basically fill all these voids. And many of us do this, right? Because food uh, food increases this dopamine cascade within our brain. And of course, dopamine is the feel-good hormone or the feel-good neur neurotransmitter. And so that's why we'll go back to these foods because they help to comfort us. They help us to feel better. Um, the problem is the foods that we go to to help us feel better usually aren't very good for our overall long-term health. So most of these foods are going to add more and more additional body fat. So they're going to make, they're going to make us overweight or obese over time. And then they're also going to, of course, create these addictive responses where we just have to keep going back to them and back to them. And so they really get control over us rather than us being able to control our health destiny. 
uh, and us being able to control our nutrition. And I found that as I ate more and more whole plant foods, not the processed plants, not the animal products, I felt better and better. And this reinforced continuing to maintain that lifestyle over time. So know that it's never easy to change your lifestyle. You know, uh, it's never easy. Um, and so there's a bunch of different ways to do it. You can do it gradually over time. Uh, generally, I recommend people just add, think of it as an additive thing rather than something that you have to subtract. So if you're, you know, if you love Doritos and Cheetos, which again are ultra processed foods that do not support our overall health, or you love bacon cheeseburgers, whatever it may be, don't think about eliminating those foods because that can create, again, that fear response. Just think about adding foods to your diet. And then over time, as you add all these whole plant foods to your diet, it's going to tend to crowd out those foods that don't support your health and that simultaneously don't support the health of the environment, nor do they support the well-being of all the wonderful, beautiful animal friends with whom we share this planet. You're going to crowd out those other foods over time, and there won't be any of this, oh, I'm going to miss this food. Oh, I can't live without this food. And again, don't worry about the future, right? Just worry about eating a plant-based meal for breakfast. And then a few hours later, worry about eating a plant-based meal for lunch. You don't have to worry about dinner. You don't have to worry about the next day. All that does is create unnecessary fear and anxiety. Just get through the next meal. And then the next meal will take care of itself because you can tackle that when it comes. But don't worry about it ahead of time. We can't control the future. The only thing we can control is right now. And like I say, when you fall in love with this lifestyle, then you do it for the kind of the three, you know, the three tiered reason upon which you might live a plant-based vegan lifestyle. And that's, I do it for the, my health. I do it for the well-being and, and the future uh, sustainability of our planet. And then I do it for the well-being of all these animals um, that under the factory farming conditions that we have. And of course, even our wild animals, because we're constantly encroaching on their territory because we need that land to raise more factory animals so that we can feed this meat addiction that we have in our society. Um, we're just killing billions of not only factory farmed animals, but also wild animals. And so if you have a love for any animals, and, and even wild animals, right? People aren't eating wild animals, but we're killing massive numbers of, of wild animals because we're constantly encroaching on their territory so that we can raise the, the crops to feed the animals, and then also house the animals that we raise for food. Um, so, you know, I hope that gives people a few good tips about why you don't need to be fearful. Again, just start to add some of these great whole plant foods to your diet. Don't worry about tomorrow. Just take care of today. Just take care of this meal. And moving forward, as like I say, as you continue to have one plant-based meal after another plant-based meal, uh, you're going to feel better and better. And that's going to make you, that's going to help reinforce you continuing to live that lifestyle over time. I think those are great tips um, and suggestions. And I just want to add, not only are we killing the animals you talked about, but we're killing ourselves because we get all those diseases that come from eating the animals and the processed foods that we eat as well. Exactly. You know, it turns right around. Most people don't see that or most people don't believe in karma. But, um, you know, of course, we kill all these animals senselessly because we don't need to eat them. And, uh, and, and even if, uh, and, and regardless of whether or not we needed to eat them, we certainly don't need to raise them and treat them the way that we do. And then, you know, and then take their lives the way that we do. Um, and so it all comes back, you know, if you want to look at it in, in like a karmic perspective, it all comes back because eating all these animals isn't good for our health. It promotes the atherosclerosis, which clogs our arteries and leads to heart disease. It promotes the, um, the insulin resistance, uh, which prevents insulin from being able to do what it needs to do to get the sugar out of our bloodstreams and into our body cells where it's needed to give us energy. And that leads to type two diabetes. And so, yes, very well said, Nancy. Uh, so here's my next question. It must be boring having to eat salad all the time. Oh, I know. You know, it's just so boring. No, and that's the thing. You know, I, I've heard this quoted a number of different times. Uh, one of the things off the top of my head says there's, I know there's tens, if not hundreds of thousands, excuse me, of edible plants, different edible plant species on this planet. And so 
but then you look at animal products, all you have is, you know, your red meat, your, your fish, your fowl, you know, your poultry, and then your dairy products that come from cows and or maybe goats, something like that, and then your eggs. And so you literally have like these five different kind of food groups, right? Or it's mostly just animal flesh and then dairy and eggs. So it could really only be considered three different food groups. And then of course, there's a few varieties of each, right? You could get your dairy from a cow or a goat, and you could get your meat from a number of different animals, whether it's a mammal or whether it's a fish, or of course, a, um, a fowl, you know, poultry. But again, that's only very few food groups. I count them on one hand. But if you look at the different edible varieties of plants on earth, there's tens if not hundreds of thousands. And then of course, you also include fungi, um, all of our mushrooms, which are wonderful for our health, as long as you're not eating the poisonous ones. And there's a ton of different varieties of those too. And those aren't even plants, those are fungi, but we lump them in with a plant-based diet. Um, or we lump those in again with vegan foods. You know, they're, they're, they're honorary plants. And so there's a number of different things you can do with adding all these different varieties of fruits and vegetables to your daily routine, to your weekly routine, um, as well as, you know, different herbs and spices. And so, you know, and, and historically around the world, most people in the past, and then even today, most people that are in developing societies where they don't have these CAFOs, these concentrated animal feeding operations that produce huge numbers of animals at scale, people aren't able to eat meat like we do in Western society. And so they've eaten, again, historically and even today, most people are eating predominantly plant-based diets. They're eating simple starches like whole intact grains, whether it be brown rice, wheat berries, um, you know, quinoa, millet, all these wonderful different types of whole grains, as well as different types of legumes, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils. And then they're adding to those starchy, more calorie dense foods, different fruits and vegetables to add variety and flavor and color and nutrient density. There's a wonderful project called the American Gut Project. And that's actually looking at the microbiomes, you know, the, the different types of species of bacteria that live in our large intestines. They are incredibly important for our, our overall health. And we want to have really diverse microbiomes. And what the American Gut Project has shown, it's, it's actually studied the microbiomes of people, even though it's called the American Gut Project, it's studied the microbiomes of, of thousands of people in, 40, in over 40 different countries. And what that project has shown is that you want to eat at least 30 different kinds of plants every week in order to maximize the health of your microbiome, to maximize the health of your gut. Again, Gabriel, it's a pleasure. And I can't wait to our next segment of... Making Sense with Gabriel. Woohoo! Take care. You too, Nancy. Great to see you. Thank you. Bye.